right, so new topic. Basically from now and until the end of semester, which is about five classes. So we have class today, and then three next week, and then one on Monday, December 5th. So a change from the previous year is that the Wednesday before Thanksgiving is off, but then there is Monday. So don't, don't forget about that. That's different from the standard UT tradition. Okay. All right. So let's introduce what is mass transport. A lot of concepts should be familiar since we went through momentum and heat transport. And for your reading pleasure, <coughs> pleasure please refer to chapters 17 and 18 in our textbook. Okay. So we have basically completed... Momentum transport, any applications of momentum transport to porous media flows. Uh, we have actually skipped macroscopic momentum transport, but that is on your topic list, uh, just in case you're preparing for the, uh, for, for the qualifying exam. Uh, and then we have completed energy or heat transport. And now we will uh, go on to mass transport. We will actually follow a very similar approach as we have so far. We will introduce, today we will introduce notation for the most part, as well as touch upon molecular basis. And all of these, all of this discussion should actually be familiar. It's just that now we are going to use new terms. So molecular basis of all of these transport processes, sort of we will rely on kinetic theory to look into some basic mechanisms and that should be familiar from our previous discussion. And then most of the time, really, we will spend solving problems with shell balances. Okay? But just like before, shell balances, using the shell balances approach, you can also derive the time-dependent equations of change. Though most often than not, in terms of solving problems, we will focus on steady-state solutions. So basically, late-time solutions as opposed to early, I'm developing my profile solutions. Okay? And pretty much I never get to the advanced topic on Taylor dispersion because there is never time. Um, it is technically on your list of topics for qualifying, but I'm yet to see it. But I didn't tell you that. All right. <laughs> so, all right. So for mass transport so far, basically we look for the most part what is happening to entire phase. So I had a liquid, a gas, and I talked about the entire phase and something is moving, basically, and by that something, I'm looking at the phase as its entirety. Now I'm actually going to look into possible chemical species within the same phase. So for instance, we never really have water, we have brine. And that means that I have different chemical species and ions that are dissolved in this brine. And I might have, in different portions of that uh, liquid, I might have different <coughs> concentrations of different ions. As we know by now, the moment I have gradients of something, transport will ensue to basically equilibrate those gradients. Okay. So essentially, we refer to the diffusion as movement of chemical species within a phase from region of some higher concentration to region of lower concentrations of the, uh, those chemical species. So in this schematic, you see, you can imagine imaginary membrane okay, that is separating two different types of molecules. And if I, at some point, remove that membrane, then because of the concentration gradient in this gray molecules or whatever they are, they're going to start moving in this direction to equilibrate the concentration. And these black dots will start moving in this direction, basically, to equilibrate. Okay? And after some time, I should see something like this, where I kind of have the equal distribution. Now, this is obviously, since this is molecular transport, 
it is obviously to track down, especially on the scale of our interest, which is either lab scale or field scale, okay? to have this individual molecular species and they're interdiffused. Interdiffusing, so I will typically have uh, two things kind of equilibrated at the same time, and it's a good day when I have only two things <laughs> interdiffusing. Most often than not, uh, the situation is more complex. And in any realistic problem, it's going to be extremely difficult to actually track everything that I'm interested. Practically, the way we actually approach this is with a label as A, the species that I'm interested in, and everything else will be B. Okay. <laughs> so essentially, we will look at so-called binary mixtures most of the time, where I have something I'm interested in and everything else because practically we cannot really track 20 species very easily computationally or otherwise. Okay. So some everyday example is of course if you drop some sugar at the bottom of your favorite drink in the morning, that is if you use, if you use sugar, which you shouldn't, uh, <laughs> not always a good idea, but I cannot have my coffee without sugar. So in any way, so assuming that you have a sugar cube at the bottom of your cup, okay, there's a very high concentration of sugar here. And in the liquid phase on the top, there is very low concentration at the very beginning. So you will naturally have some diffusion to, uh, to, uh, for that to happen. Now, we know that we also have gravity at work here in my favorite cup every morning. So typically, this process would be very slow or wouldn't even happen because gravity will pull my species down and leave them at the bottom of the cup. So we typically have to help this process with stirring, which is essentially convection. Okay. So typically if I do have convection present, it's going to be dominant type of, uh, 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 dominant type of transfer. Uh, the second everyday example is somewhere later in the afternoon. You might be done with your coffee, but you still like soda or something that has uh, that is uh, filled with CO2 under pressure. So the moment you open the cap on a bottle that has been pressurized, basically you will have CO2 on the top of the bottle leave. And essentially, because of that, you will create a concentration gradient, so CO2 from the bottom will start rising. And you will literally see the bubbles going up in your drink, and eventually it will go flat because it's really chillable. Okay? So essentially, that transfer. Now, mathematically, you can either put this, so you will have certain boundary conditions at different phases, right? So as your CO2 is escaping to the atmosphere, it's changing from the liquid phase, it's going to the vapor phase on top. So you might actually need to work with some boundary conditions. So here on the boundary, you will actually have some flux out, for instance, when you're solving uh, the equation. But that's the, basically the details of how you're going to solve, uh, solve this. Okay? So those are some everyday examples. Now, we will mostly work with so-called ordinary diffusion here. So I'm just going to look at the concentration differences, nothing else. Though technically, I could actually have any other gradients also cause my species to move. So for instance, I could have heavier molecules and not so heavy molecules, and then gravity will then pull heavier mo molecules. There will be disproportionate pulling on the other two, and that's not necessarily my pressure gradient. It's not that I impose the pressure gradient. So that's, for instance, forced dis diffusion. So it's forced by some other force and not concentration difference. Okay. So we will typically kind of separate, or if I have multiple things at play, uh, uh, at play I'm going to kind of look at all of the separate con contributions together. And we are all of the equations that we are actually be going to look into here are going to be just the concentration gradients and how they affect my transfer. Now, you will also hear the term dispersion. And if we are talking about mass transport, diffusion and dispersion are the same thing. However, if you have, for instance, wave, waves or wave equations, then dispersion is something else. You will have, for instance, 
like hit a boundary between two different uh, two different materials, and because of the different transport coefficients in different materials and some reflection and so forth, you will have that light break into different wavelengths, for instance, and that's dispersion. Okay. Now that has nothing to do with diffusion. That's simply a slightly different term, but we need to disambiguate uh, what means what. Yeah. Now, in porous media, which is what we're interested in, diffusion is a slower, uh, typically the slowest of the transport, um, and it's typically much uh, slower than convection. That doesn't mean that it's not relevant, okay? And there are situations where diffusion can become competitive in terms of the time scales at which it happens with convection. That's specifically the case in so-called tight media. Okay? In those tight media, for instance, we have uh, clays that have very, very low conductivity or permeability, and basically the diffusion will catch up with any kind of uh, convection or pressure induced uh, pressure gradient induced transport in these rocks. And similar is the case with mud rocks or, or shale. So in both of those types of media, you have, compared, compared to the regular sandstone, you have pore spaces that are about 100 to 1,000 times smaller. Okay. And in those cases, then you're really slowing down uh, any transport uh, related to pressure differences, and mass transport is simply able to catch up. Okay. So you cannot just... Uh, ignore or s necessarily look at them separately, you might need to couple the equations and look at both types of transport to actually see what is the ultimately the flux that you're going to see uh, through that medium. Okay, so let's introduce some notation. Okay, we're going to talk about, and you will have equations for two uh, types of. Um, of concentrations. One will be basically just mass concentration or density and mass fractions. But at the same time, and those are technically equivalent, we will look at the molar concentration and molar fraction. And different types of problems will be given different type of information and you will essentially pick based on that uh, information. So we will have species A and everything else I will call B, so technically I'm going to look at the binary mixture of A and B. And normally, so far, when I looked at the density, I just said density is rho for my entire phase. So now I have phase that actually within has two types of molecules, A and B, and I can actually look at densities of those A and B separately. So basically, I look at the density of A simply as all of the mass of all of the molecules of A divided by the volume. Okay? And then I have B, and I look at the mass of all of the molecules of B, and I divide that by volume. So sum of both of them will give me actually my density of the entire phase. Okay? So I'll basically split my density into two. So basically, I will have rho A as mass of everything related to A divided by the volume that I'm looking into. And my units are still kilogram per meter cube. And I can do the same for B. So basically my entire phase density is density of A plus density of B. Okay. Now if I look at, I'm going to look at also mass fraction. So this is convenient. I can actually introduce dimensionless units. Dimensionless units are helpful analytically because I can compare things easily. They're also helpful numerically because when I have things that are uh, around number one and everything is around number one or between zero and one, then I'm going to have much less numerical error because I'm not adding things that are on the order of one to things that are order to 10 to the minus six and then introducing errors in there. So typically when I have units, uh, that can, just simply because I'm dealing with realistic units and everybody chooses different sets of units, that can introduce inadvertently some num numerical error. So it is a good idea to solve your equations in dimensionless units. 
So mass fraction omega a will be rho a simply divided by rho. So rho a divided by rho a plus rho b. And if you can also look at it as mass of all molecules of A uh, divided by mass of all molecules, okay? Because I can, if I'm looking at the same control volume, my volume is the same, so I can take that out of the equation. And then naturally from this, if I divide this equation by rho, I'm going to get that omega A plus omega B is equal to 1. And that helps me typically, I'm going to express, for instance, omega b as 1 minus omega a. Okay? Just like you would, deal it, you would be dealing with saturations in coarse media equations. Okay? Uh-huh. So for the mass concentration of So this is my fraction. If I'm considering fractions, this is it. So here, look, look at this part. I'm looking at the same volume. Okay, same volume. So I'm looking, if I look at rho, it's simply mass of all molecules divided by that volume. Okay? But I can split that mass as MA plus MB. So mass of all of all molecules of A plus mass of all of molecules of B divided by V. So then rho is rho A plus rho B. So. so this is my rho A by definition, and this is my rho B. Does that help? So I'm simply splitting them into two groups, that's all. And behaving like the other one. And then I could look at the molar. This is actually Na with a, subs a subscript. So basically, I can just look at the number of moles of A divided by V. And I'm going to refer to that concentration as Ca. It's in moles per meter cube. And then similarly, my overall molar concentration for the entire phase is Ca plus Cb. And when I'm looking at the molar fraction, I'm going to refer to it as xA. Okay, so I'm simply going to divide CA by C. For xB, I'm going to divide CB by C. And from this equation, when I divide it by C, I'm going to get that xA plus xB is equal to 1. Okay, are we good? All right. Now I have to deal with, of course, moving phases. So normally I was looking at the velocity of the entire phase. And uh, when I was averaging velocity in my volume, I was averaging all of the species that I might have with it. And now I'm trying to look at some separate species. Okay? So technically, in certain situations, I might have in this volume entire species A B on one side, the entire species B on B on the other side, and they're moving <laughs> counter diffusing, right? So on average on the outside, I see velocity as a zero, though within I actually have counter diffuse. Okay? So we have to define things relative to each other. Okay? So the flux of particular species, then I'm going to refer to VA, and that's basically velocity of all of the uh, species A molecules in my volume. And similarly, I'm going to have VB. And then my actual phase velocity is the mass average of the two. So I'm going to have a fraction of A times VA plus the fraction of B times VB. Okay. So this situation of counter diffusing, technically, I could have, let's say that this is one half, this is one half, right? and they're just simply opposite to each other, but they're the same velocities, then I'm going to have my average velocity is zero, even though the species within are moving. Okay. So that's something to recognize. Now, most of the cases, I'm not going to have just like a static thing. I'm going to actually have my fluid flow, right? And some species within moving relatively to it.
Now, if I multiply this by rho, then I can look at the, my momentum, rho v, or momentum density, and then rho v is equal to density of A, V A plus density of B, V B. Now, similarly, as for mass, I can look at the molar averages. So my mole average velocity, I'm going to put a star on it just to differentiate them. And sometimes, yes, I'm going to have different uh, velocities depending whether I'm looking at number of moles versus number uh, versus mass. And the basic reason why I might have differences is that mass is conserved, but number of moles is not. Especially if I have reactions in this one. So my molar averages and mass averages might be ever so slightly different. And then C times this V star is sim similarly, if I basically multiply this by C, I'm going to get C times XA is CA by definition, okay? because XA is CA divided by C. And C times XB is CB, by definition again. So I have CAVA plus CBVB. Okay. All right, time for my parallel. I have to have some parallel plates problem here and very simple linear, <laughs> linear law. And this one is called fixed law. Okay. So I'm going to look at the, the simplest possible case for diffusion will be basically a slab of solid. Okay, so I don't have my fluid flowing or anything like that messing me up and coupling things. Okay, so I'm just going to look at my solid phase uh, simply being static, being st sitting put. And let's say that I have my silica slab and I introduce some helium on the bottom of that silica. And I'm keeping it at, so I have basically a supply here that is keeping the fraction, mass fraction of this, I'm going to call helium A. So mass fraction of A at omega A0. So this is my boundary condition right here. Okay. At the same time, I have some stream flow or air flow or something that is taking any uh, helium that has diffused to the other side away. So I can assume that I'm keeping this concentration here at zero. Okay. You can bring a hair dryer if you'd like and <laughs> take any helium that is interdiffusing uh, inter away. So after some time, if I impose this concentration gradient, after some time, I expect to see a linear profile in concentration. Okay. So at the late time, and that is my steady state behavior, so since I'm constantly supplying helium here, okay, I will actually have a constant flux through. And that flux we're going to refer to as JA in Y direction, so JAY. Okay? So my JAY is basically molecular mass flux in Y direction divided by this area S, and I'm referring to it as S because I'm using A for, for, for helium, okay? So I have to change my area A to area S. And I'm going to assume it in this linear simple case that is proportional to a coefficient that I'm going to refer to as rho VAB, so this is diffusion constant of A with respect to species B, so I'm recognizing that I have two species within, and that's going to be my difference in concentration, it's going to be also pro proportional to difference in these concentrations, which in this case is omega A0, and inversely proportional to the thickness of my slab. So this is where my gradient comes into play. So basically in one direction I have minus rho dAB, d omega a divided by dy, and by now I know that I'm always going from higher to lower, and therefore I have to have a minus phase. Okay? So how would I generalize this to a vector? 
So to 3D situation, I'm going to have a vector j a here that will have x, y, z coordinates. For each coordinate, there will be similar log. So what is my j a as a vector? Minus rho d a b times gradient of omega a. So spatial gradient of omega a in three directions. Okay, great. Now, what are the units? <laughs> Excuse this hanging equation here. Uh, what are the units of dab? Can you work it out on paper based on the equation that I wrote here? And I will mean, meanwhile set up to write on my sketchbook. What are the units that you got? Hmm? Hmm? So length squared, meter squared per time, which is second. And this is why I actually throw in this density here of the phase to kind of normalize it and get diffusion con uh, constant as meter square per second. Why? Because in every other type of transport, we had a coefficient that was meter square per second as well. Right? So I had kinematic viscosity that was meter square per second. And I also had that alpha when I normalized my thermal conductivity by dividing it by a row and uh, thermal capacity of constant pressure, then I was also getting meters square per second. And that allows me to compare different types of transport to see who is dominant. So let's just briefly review those before I start writing. So basically I had the parental number which was basically looking at the momentum versus energy transport. Okay. So I was taking my kinematic viscosity divided by my normalized thermal conductivity, alpha. Both were in meter square per second, so Prandtl number was dimensionless number. Okay. And if it's larger than one, then basically my momentum transport is dominant, otherwise the other one uh, is dominant, or possibly they are similar. And I also had the clay number that also looked into the convection, uh, convective transport in addition to it, which if I just multiply Prandtl by Reynolds. Now we will look at the so-called Schmidt number. Okay. SC is my kinematic viscosity divided by DAB. So I'm going to look at the mass transfer analog, analog of Prandtl number. So again, if it's larger than one, momentum transport is dominant as opposed to mass transfer. And I could also have a Peclet number for mass by multiplying the Reynolds number times Schmidt number. And I'm gonna, I have three types of transport so I can look at all combinations. Lewis number is looking at thermal or heat transport versus mass. So Prandtl, Schmidt, Lewis, most of the time in literature, you will actually look at the Peclet number. 
So more often than not, you will look at the Peclé number for both heat and mass transport. And Reynolds number just in itself when looking at momentum. All right. So those are some dimensionless numbers. It's important to figure out when you're working on a problem which transport is dominant. So can you discard some <laughs> one part of the equations and make your life simpler? Now, JA and JB, if I have two different species, they are defined with the respect of the center of mass, okay? And possibly that center, uh, center of mass is shifting as my concentrations are shifting, but the sum of JA and JB is zero by definition, okay? And that's because technically, so in my fixed law, my little slab of helium, this velocity was for low concentration to assume zero or close to zero, okay? So it wasn't moving far, but basically my di this mass flux is defined relative to the velocity of the entire phase. And this is especially important if I actually have the phase moving, okay? So I want to basically define things relative. So then let's, that's actually going to help me look okay. If I have JA and JB, technically in one of them there will be DAB by definition and the other will be DBA, okay? And I'm wondering mathematically how are they related? So let's look into that for a moment. Uh, okay. So basically I'm wondering, so by definition, my JA, why am I writing in red? My mass flux of species A is actually rho A times v B, uh, VA minus V. So defined relative to phase velocity or average, my mass average velocity. And also JB is rho B, VB minus V. So when I sum them both up, and again, that definition is there because I want to separate what's going on just due to the concentration gradient versus any other velocity of the entire phase, right? That might be there also due to pressure gradients, okay? So my JA plus JB is, when I add that up, it's JAVA minus JAV plus JBVB minus JBV. Now I'm gonna put together this term and this term. So J A, uh, rho A is my rho times omega A, correct? V A. And this is rho omega B, V B. So I'm just gonna write it as this. Minus J, I can group this omega A plus omega B, B. What is this? V, by definition. So I have rho V minus, what is this? Rho. Cool. Now I know, again, by definition, or by fixed law, not by definition, but by fixed law, 
is, oops, omega, by Fick's law, my Ja is, my flux of species A is minus rho, diffusive constant Dab, gradient of omega A, okay? And Jb is minus rho dBA, So I'm wondering, well, what is dBA? And how is it related to dAB? Okay, so this is Fick's law. Fick's first law, actually. So my question is, how are dAB and dBA related? Whoops. Any guesses? Just throw in a guess. No guesses? Come on. Be adventurous. Same. There we go. They are same. Let's prove. Okay? So they're both positive. I would like to say, oh, these things are defined opposite to each other. Maybe I would like to say DA, DBA is minus DAB, except that all of the transport coefficients have to be positive. Therefore, they should be the same. All right, let's actually see that. Okay. So my GB, I can write as, it's minus rho DBA. Whoops, hi, D, D rho. gradient of B, and I will actually remember that omega A plus omega B is 1. Okay. So what is gradient of omega A plus gradient of omega B? 0. Cool. I can use that. So this is going to be plus rho dBA gradient of omega A. Now I also know that JB is simply minus JA, right? So it's also, I'm just going to continue writing here, it's minus rho DAB omega A. Oh, plus. Because JA is negative rho DAB gradient of omega A. So these two things have to be equal. This is the same, this is the same, this is the same, this is the same. Therefore, DAB is equal to DBA. Quite frankly, imagine measuring them if they were somehow different. <laughs> okay. So my DBA is the same as DAB. Cool. Now before we actually uh, move to solving some problems, uh, let's look at first some example values to get the feeling what the, these numbers are uh, in absolute terms. So this, I just pulled out three examples uh, from the textbook. You can look at more tables. Tables are in chapter 17. So all of this is going to be done for low concentration of my species A. The problem with higher concentration is that my uh, DAB, my transport coefficient, will start being dependent on the concentration. So specifically for high concentrations, I'm not necessarily, you can look at it this way. When I have low concentration of A, that most of the time when I'm interdiffusing, my molecule of A is interacting with molecules of B. 
and I'm referring to that transport coefficient as BAB. Okay. Now, if I have start having very high concentration of A, then most of the time I'm actually interacting with more fields of A, and sometimes of B. So then it becomes a little more complex. So you will have actually concentration de dependence of transport properties, though for the most practical examples and for the most theory is developed for low concentrations of A. Now, just some examples. If I have gas, diffusing in gas, like CO2 and uh, uh, ni nitrogen, then, for instance, your DAB will be 0.15 centimeter square, uh, square per second. If you're looking at ethanol in water, you're going to have something that is 10 to the 5, 5 orders of magnitude smaller, actually 6. So, if you look at the uh, silica and helium, this is, this is the example that I started with in my silica slab. Then you have another five to six orders. So basically, it's most easy thing for gases to introduce the moment I'm in liquids or solids, then I'm slowing down considerably uh, while moving through. So again, if you want to look at more examples, you can look at the tables in chapter 17. Now, my diffusive constant in general increases with temperature. Okay? And I'm looking, if I'm looking at the gases at low density, my diffusivity can be assumed as independent of concentrations. In liquids and solids, at la larger concentrations, I'm actually strongly start getting uh, dependent on concentration, especially if I'm in liquids and solids. Okay? So concentration does matter. All right. So main messages that we've had so far in both momentum transport and heat transport hold here as well. Flux happens when there is a gradient of potential. And ultimately, all of these mechanisms that we're looking at, even though we're looking at them in average sense, we know that details are molecular, and I'm ultimately basically just upscaling what's going on on the molecular level. So for basic understanding, we're going to go to kinetic theory approach just to see what would be my diffusive constant if I had gases at low density where I can apply kinetic theory. So my standard assumptions will be there. I have gas, and I'm assuming that molecules of gas are balls of certain diameter. And they're sort of bouncing around, and when they collide, there's a perfectly elastic collision. Okay, so I'm not wasting any energy on that. And I'm not, in this case, looking at complex molecules that might also have some other attractive forces to them. Okay, so I'm just looking at basic uh, kinetic theory. So we know already that we will look at, we will refer to N as number density, number of molecules per unit volume. Lambda will be mean free path between two different collisions. And I know its formula, it depends on the diameter of the molecule and the member density. And also, if I look, so my lambda is some difference in regular space. If I'm actually looking at the planar difference in one of the directions between the, these two positions, I'm referring to that distance as A and it's uh, on average two-thirds lambda. And I will look at the average speed, uh, basically speed as in magnitude of the velocity, and that's related to my macroscopic temperature using constant here. What's the name of this constant? Boltzmann, Boltzmann constant. Okay, And I, of course, depend on the mass of the molecule. And one thing that we need in the... Uh, proofs is that frequency of molecular bombardment when I'm actually moving around. So I put a plane on one side of the plane. I'm going to have basically the average number of molecules that bump into that plane given with C. Okay. All right. So all of those are very pretty much the same as what we did for momentum and heat transport. And now we're going to look at the simplifying assumption. We are diffusing along the, not the same, but very similar type of molecules. Okay. 
So I don't have to think about different balls of different mass bumping into each other. But I'm going to just assume that my molecules are for uh, all the same mass and diameter for this particular uh, derivation. And I'm going to in, uh, impose now uh, the difference in concentrations. And locally, I will look at that uh, linearized profile at steady state, given as this. So this is my concentration at position y minus say concentration at position y and concentration at position uh, omega uh, uh, y plus a. Okay. So as a linearized profile, I can refer to this omega as omega, for instance, y minus a is omega at this position minus the distance a times d omega dy. Okay. Great. So now I'm looking at the mass flux of this species a across my plane at y is equal to a. So it's mass of all the molecules crossing in plus y direction minus any of those who uh, don't agree with this gradient and actually go down anyway. Okay. And on the molecular level, I will have uh, such things happen. So for any molecules that are crossing this plane, okay, their last collision, so they're going in this direction, their last collision was somewhere below, okay, approximately at planar distance A below. Okay. So essentially, I'm looking at number of these collisions is Z, okay, and I'm looking at the mass of A evaluated at Y minus A, which is where my last collision was. And then minus, basically if I'm looking for anybody crossing in the other direction, again, how many of those I have, on average I have Z of them. Okay. And I'm looking at mass, so I have mass of species A, I have a gradient of it, right? So mass of species A is different in these different locations because I impose the gradient. So basically, I'm going to evaluate Z times MA uh, from this last collision above the plane because those are the ones that are carried down. And that's essentially my mass flux in Y direction for my species A. Cool. So now I just throw in the formulas that I know. So Z is one-fourth N U. MA evaluated at Y minus A minus the same thing evaluated at Y plus A. Okay. Now number of molecules times mass of molecules is essentially my density of A because this is mass of individual molecule. So essentially I'm going to have rho or density evaluated at Y minus A, uh, rho times omega A so my rho times concentration uh, of A evaluated at Y minus A minus the same thing evaluated at Y plus A. Okay. So my average speed of molecules, that's the same. That doesn't change based on the concentration because that's looking at the individual molecule. And here I can now assume that omega A is this Taylor serious expansion just to the first term. Just give me a moment to finish this. So basically when I do that, this minus this is minus 2 times a d omega a dy. And when I clean that up, I'm going to get that my flux omega a y is minus rho times a coefficient that depends on this average speed times lambda. So it depends only on my type of gas that I have times d omega a dy. And this is essentially when I compare it to the Fick's law, I'm going to get that basically my diffusion constant is this 1 over 3 average speed times lambda. Okay? And I can now throw in what these mean. And when I get this, I'm going to get the dependence on temperature and my density of the entire thing. So we will pick up next time. We have just a couple of slides left on this. I see you on Monday. Enjoy Thanksgiving.